Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to continue our discussion regarding life on the registry by specifically focusing on residency restrictions. <clears throat> this chapter also addresses civil commitment, but in an effort to keep your lecture more centralized on one topic, I will only be addressing residency restrictions today. You should still read the full chapter in your book, but we will only be focusing on the residency restrictions talk here. The reason why I've made this decision is because we'll, we will be examining several issues with these policies and we'll be looking specifically at Florida and at Texas and how their policies impact those individuals living on the registry. Let's go ahead and get started by looking at residency restrictions in a more general sense before we get into the two state specifics. So to begin with, what exactly are residency restrictions? Depending on the state, these are policies that affect either all sex offenders or just those who have child victims. Residency restrictions require sex offenders from living within a certain geographical distance to places where children are frequently present. These locations include schools, parks and public pools, preschools, daycares, bus stops, arcades, or any other area where children are frequently present. The nearness of residency restrictions is measured in feet. Policies frequently range from 500 feet to 2,500 foot buffer zones or halos that are placed around the child congregation areas. The only area that is not affected are churches. To include churches would violate the constitutional protections that are afforded to registered sex offenders regarding freedom of religion. So even if there is a playground or a school located adjacent to a church, then the, ch the church will trump the other locations. These policies were implemented as a way to protect children, but are also rooted in the idea that sex offenders will abduct children from these public locations. Like all things, there is always the exception to the rule, but for the most part, registered sex offenders do not abduct children from public locations. Why? It is too dangerous and too open to detection. Remember that 90% of sex crimes occur when there is a pre-existing relationship of some kind between the offender and the victim. This doesn't indicate that a stranger style abduction will occur. It is still possible, but statistically not likely. Still policymakers believe that the implementation of residency restrictions will decrease sex offender recidivism. Empirical research once again does not support this idea that residency restrictions are in any way effective in achieving that goal. But that is the rationale for their use. We will discuss more of the logistics surrounding these policies as we move through the lecture, but basically these geographic zones create boundaries around specific locations and provide restricted and unrestricted areas for sex offenders. Restricted areas are those in which sex offenders are not allowed to reside and unrestricted zones are um, or provide le legal areas of residence for these individuals. In many cities and towns, the restricted areas far outweigh the unrestricted ones and leave registered sex offenders limited areas in which they can reside. Residency restriction laws are based on the same premise that the drug-free zone policies of the 1970s were. These zero to tolerance policies increase the penalties that are associated with drug possession, sale, and distribution crimes that occur within a 1,000 foot boundary of the school. Later, these same boundaries are associated with sex offenders under the premise that if you can keep sex offenders away from the school by the same distance, then sex offenders will be limited in their opportunity to victimize children. Florida was the very first state to pass this type of legislation in 1995. We're going to discuss Florida in a lot more detail later on, but they are the first ones to implement residency restrictions statewide at a 1,000 foot boundary. By 2005, 14 states has resi residency restrictions for sex offenders. By 2013, 33 states had such policies. And by 2017, 35 states had such policies. Because of the limited availability in suitable housing that is caused by residency restrictions, Researchers have compared these policies to modern day banishment. By banishing sex offenders to live as outsiders, policymakers are forcing them further from their treatment providers, supervision officers, 
support systems, and other services that these individuals may need to access in order to successfully re-enter society post-conviction. In implementing these policies, we assume that sex offender recidivism will be decreased. But instead, all that we are doing is creating a false sense of security. Why, you may ask? Because residency restrictions dictate where registered sex offenders can sleep. Many state laws do not address physical movement or daily activities. If a sex offender really wanted to, and this is not happening as often as we are led to believe, all they would have to do is walk up to a child and snatch them from a Walmart or a playground or wherever else, and they are legally living where they're supposed to live while they do it. But that's not how people are committing their sex crimes. Instead, they already have legitimate access to the child that they are trying to victimize. They have access to that victim through family relationships, friendships, or even through work. They don't need to abduct their victims. Why make it more difficult for themselves? And besides, if they want to keep committing sex crimes, then they're going to have to victimize someone they know that they can keep quiet. The fastest way to, um, to be detected is to have that child go missing. So residency restrictions are making us feel safe, but they are protecting us from an event that rarely happens and is arbitrary in implementation. The legal challenges to residency restrictions focus on some of the same arguments that we saw in the last chapter that center on, on due process, double jeopardy, and ex post facto protections. But once again, residency restrictions are civil in nature rather than being criminal sanctions, so none of these protections are actually being violated according to the court. They, these are public safety mechanisms and the, the, that aspect of things outweighs the individual. One of the more interesting things about residency restrictions is that there is no real federal legislation that mandates their existence. That leaves things up to state and local governments, so getting SCOTUS involved is going to be a little trickier than it would be for cases focusing on the sex offender registry as a whole. When m multiple levels of government pass these restrictions, contradictions can occur between local ordinances and state and potentially federal laws. But because we are challenging local st and state laws, it is rare for the federal courts to get involved. Potentially, SCOTUS could hear a case on residency restrictions based on constitutional violations, but at the time of this recording, SCOTUS has not chosen to hear any cases focused on residency restrictions. So the challenges are being heard in state courts. In some cases, residency restrictions have been declared illegal due to conflicts with state law. These cases involve GH versus the Township of Galloway in 2008, People v. Overlander, 2009, and People v. Blair, 2009. The Commonwealth v. Baker case is one of the only ones to focus on the punitive nature of residency restrictions. The majority of cases like State v. Stark uphold residency restrictions based on public safety functions. Federally, the highest court, to, the highest court challenge of sex offender residency restrictions to date occurred in the Eighth Circuit. But once again, SCOTUS has refused to hear any cases that are related to this topic. Part of the banishment argument focuses on the idea of physical isolation of the sex offender in order to protect the community at large. Physically removing the offender from potential targets provides that feeling of safety, but in reality, making reentry more difficult for the sex offender does not help that person achieve success post-conviction. Allowing the individual access to support systems, legal resources, employment, and suitable housing are all related to lower levels of reoffending. Banishment removes all of those elements and makes reoffending a more likely occurrence. The other thing that physical isolation does is it forces registered sex offenders to live together or in clusters due to the limited amount of housing availability. Nothing wigs people out more than the clusters of sex offenders living in groups. In their mind, they have to be plotting or conniving together to find children to abduct. So if you won't let them live in communities, then this is the alternative, but then you create a situation that is even scarier for many citizens. The final option is forcing them off the map. This indicates that registered sex offenders will live in the woods, will become transient, or will give up altogether in trying to comply with the law. 
They will do their own thing, which if you're trying to monitor sex offenders, this is the outcome that you don't want to occur. You want to be sure that they are being monitored so that they don't recidivate like you fear them doing. The supervision aspect of things becomes much more difficult if you don't know the location of your offenders or if they are living in remote areas. Many supervision officers require their offenders to come into the office and on some occasions the officer will visit the offender's residence to make sure that person is living where they say they are. This becomes time consuming and difficult if the offender has to travel great distances to or I'm sorry, if the officer rather has to travel great distances to visit the offender and is even more difficult if the offender cannot travel into the office. For many offenders, not just registered sex offenders, community members don't want these individuals living nearby. They perceive themselves to be at risk and so they say, not in my backyard. Have them go live somewhere else, but eventually there is nowhere else. There is nowhere for them to go. When you keep pushing and pushing, eventually there's nowhere else to push them to. One of the biggest problems associated with residency restrictions is not necessarily available housing, but affordable housing. Many upscale neighborhoods are far enough away from schools, playgrounds, and other child-centric locations that they become viable options for sex offenders, but they are simply not affordable for these individuals. We will talk about this particular issue more when we get into the dynamics of Florida's residency restriction law in just a few slides. But when there is such a limited availability for housing, a few things will occur. First, registered sex offenders simply take the risk and live within one of the boundaries because it's what they can afford. Hopefully my landlord doesn't find out that I'm a registered sex offender and law enforcement doesn't come to check the boundary line. Or secondly, I will go live with someone else and that person will be the technical resident. I could just simply be a permanent guest. The one big issue that we have yet to discuss is the idea of family life. Residency restrictions only impact the registered sex offender legally. But if that person is living with a spouse or with children, then the decision has to be made for the whole family to move and stay together or for the registered sex offender to live alone. As we already discussed, social isolation from family members and social support systems can be detrimental to the RSO, um, registered sex offender rather, their entry success. In this scenario, if the registered sex offender is an adult, then it might be a little easier for that individual to go find a small studio or something like that and live separately but nearby. But what happens when the registered sex offender in question is a minor themselves? I'm a 15 year old who is required to abide by residency restrictions due to the nature of my crime. I cannot go live on my own. I'm 15 years old. So now this is a case in which the whole family might have to move. Or maybe the juvenile sex offender has to go live with an extended family member. Or maybe one parent might have to move with that child and the other parents stay with the remaining children. These laws are meant only for the registered sex offender, but they do cause more family disruption than we originally realized. The biggest concern that comes out of Levinson, Levinson's research is the idea of homelessness. Jill Levinson is a preeminent re, uh, registered sex offender researcher out of Florida who has spent many years examining the effects of sex offender policies on the lives of registered sex offenders. She has seen the homelessness issue firsthand specifically around the Miami-Dade area where she's based out of. It's the perfect opportunity and segue into the Florida case I promised you at the beginning of lecture. After discussing the Levinson research, I want to spend a little time discussing Florida in terms of residency restrictions. Florida is important for a few reasons. First, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture, Florida was the first state to implement residency restrictions at the state level in 1995. Secondly, Florida is the state in which residency restrictions have gone really wrong. Florida passed a state law that required the entire state to implement residency restrictions of 1,000 feet for child protected zones. So again, these are schools, playgrounds, daycares, bus stops, and other places that we have been discussing throughout the lecture. The law then, and the law now, only applies to those offenders who have committed a sex crime against a minor who was younger than 16 years old at the time of the offense. At a basic level, this makes more sense than a basic law targeting all sex offenders, no matter the victim type. 
While we know that there are plenty of issues with residency restriction laws, if you're going to still pass this type of legislation, then at least gear it towards those offenders who have committed crimes against children. Those individuals with adult victims are not the ones you're going to be affecting here. But anyway, that's how Florida has set it up. Residency restrictions only affect those who have committed a crime against someone who is younger than 16 years of age at the time of the offense. The secondary part of the law authorizes local governments, city and counties, to expand the scope of the residency restrictions if they feel it is necessary and appropriate. But at a minimum, all local governments must implement, implement the 1,000 foot boundary required by state law. The Miami-Dade municipality decided that they were going to take the state up on their offer and expand their residency restrictions to 2,500 feet. This is one of the widest boundaries in the state. As you can see on the map on your screen, on the lower right hand corner, um, this is a picture of Miami-Dade. Miami-Dade is a very large county that encompasses part of the Everglades as well, which is uninhabitable for anyone who is not an alligator or a python. This is a map of Miami and Miami Beach. For anyone who has ever been to Miami or has seen it on TV, it's a very beautiful area and a very, very populated one. It is also an expensive area to live in and is comprised of a lot of high-rise condos and apartments given the amount of people who want to live on or adjacent to the water. This map shows a couple different areas that allow motorists to travel over the intercoastal in order to get to the beach. You can take A1A or you can take 112, which is otherwise known as the Julia Tuttle Causeway. The Julia Tuttle Causeway is the focus of our adventure in Florida today. This is a satellite view of the same area we just looked at. This picture shows the causeway itself. To the left is Miami proper, and on the right, the bridge leads to Miami Beach. The area we are concerned about is the space with the black box listed around it. Under this part of the causeway, a group of re-entering sex offenders were required to live under the bridge due to the increased residency restrictions that were present at both the state and local level. Um, this area was nicknamed Bookville after a man named Ron Book who crafted the state and county laws pertaining to sex offenders. I have a video clip posted on Blackboard and you will meet Ron Book in that video clip. Um, I'm sorry, we're on Canvas now, not Blackboard. I apologize. <laughs> So what is so special about this bridge? Well, re-entering sex offenders were basically required to live underneath that causeway in the hot Florida sun with no running water, no electricity, and were supervised under this bridge through the use of electronic monitors, ankle monitors rather, and probation check-ins. This picture shows the shanty town that was developed underneath the bridge. You can see that there are tents, um, there's some TVs, there's plastic tarps, and whatever else you could use to make a little area, um, a little residence or a little house, for instance. Remember that these individuals were, were told by the state that they had to live here underneath this bridge. So if this is your primary residence, you're going to do everything you can to make this area a little bit more comfortable for yourself, but that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but you can see here that people are trying to make it work however they can. Here is another view of the overpass and some of the tents that are located underneath it. You can see that the residents have left graffiti messages addressing the conditions that they're living under. You see um, words or phrases like, they don't want us to make it, no more pain, and this is inhumane. The offenders are clearly addressing their frustration and anger over their living situation. The tent was primarily made up of men who are living there. This is an alternative view of the bridge from the, other, from the other side. You'll see that Miami is across the bay and with it comes multi-million dollar high rises and expensive way of living. Something that many of these registered sex offenders cannot afford to live in. After you have to pay your court costs, potential attorney fees, restitution, supervision costs, and anything else, there is very little money left for rent. And certainly not Miami rent. Living right across the intercoastal from these multi-million dollar high-rises, you have people who are living in squalor. Right across, um, or you can see piles of trash on the side by the water, and you can imagine the smell that is putting out from all that garbage in the middle of summer. 
that has to be a disgusting smell. So this is something that the city has mandated for these offenders to do, but you can imagine that this is becoming a problem for many Miami residents. Not necessarily because people are overly concerned about the offenders, maybe some are, but this is an eyesore for the city. Florida is a big tourist state that relies on a lot of revenue from those who come to visit the beaches. If this is what they're seeing, this puts a damper on the whole tourist attraction side of things. Here's another picture from the compound. You'll notice that they have tried to make a little makeshift um, community bathroom or a little washroom here. There's a little utility sink and some lockers, a little shelf that has a few items under it, um, a little table for people to eat at. But even with these efforts, it's still apparent that these people are living underneath a bridge. Here is a resident, and I want you to note the, the ankle monitor that he is wearing. He's being supervised through electronic monitoring under the bridge. But this compound is so official that actual residents are being hooked up to their monitors so that they are required to be within a certain vicinity of the bridge. Dependent on whether this is a GPS or radio frequency monitor, this, probation, or this individual's probation officer would be able to determine if the resident has moved beyond the agreed upon boundaries of the bridge. That's very official and it solidifies that the Julia Tuttle Causeway community was state sanctioned. Finally, this last picture is of another resident named Homer Barkley and his driver's license. You'll notice that on the official license issued by the state that his address is listed as the Julia Tuttle Causeway in Miami, Florida. But what do you see on the lower right hand corner of the license? You'll notice the numbers 943.0435 FS. This designates Mr. Barkley as a sex offender pursuant to Florida statute 943.01435. That is the statute that requires sex offenders to register with the state or face the penalty of incarceration of no more than one year. That's a felony in the state of Florida if you do not um, register with the state, failure to register. Sex offenders in the state of Florida are identified as such on their driver's license. This picture once again solidifies the official nature of the bridge colony and shows state regulations um, to identify offenders. On the class website, I've provided you with a video link that shows what the colony was like while it was in existence. The colony was disbanded in 2009 and sex offenders were forced to relocate. But where? Anywhere you, um, anywhere you could find that didn't violate the terms of the residency restrictions. But in the video, you will see how the colony was started, the man responsible for its existence, and what it was like to live underneath this bridge. For many, the closure of the tent community meant that they would need to leave Miami-Dade and relocate somewhere else that was more affordable. This might mean that they would have to leave families behind or commute a longer distance so they could afford to live somewhere other than underneath a bridge. The Miami-Dade Bridge community was just one instance of residency restrictions getting out of control in Florida. In the Tampa Bay area along the Gulf Coast of the state, a group of sex offenders have found a trailer park community to live in which allowed many of them to room together in order for them to be able to obey the residency restrictions there. This resulted in a public outcry because of the concentration of, residency or of registered sex offenders in one central area. There is an awesome documentary um, that PBS did on the Tampa Bay community called Pervert Park if you want to watch that film. I've also provided a link to that on your class website. So now I want to turn our attention to Texas and discuss things from a more developing perspective. Texas law is radically different from Florida law and um, here in Texas we do not have a state law mandating that all cities must implement residency restrictions. Instead, prior to 2017, the law stated that home rule cities, those with, larger, with populations larger than 5,000 residents, were able to create their own laws regarding residency restrictions. If they wanted to implement these restrictions, great. If they didn't want to, that's fine too. General law cities, meaning those with populations less than 5,000 residents, were not able to implement residency restrictions in the same way. Texas law changed and in, 2000, in September 2017, general law cities were given the same authority as home rule cities. The new laws allow for, the, for an exemption process. 
meaning that the cities had to provide a hearing to prove that these individuals were not a threat and allow for a grandfather clause that allowed residents to remain in their current homes even if they were in violation of the residency restrictions, provided that they lived there before the law went into effect. The exclusionary zones cannot be larger than a thousand feet. The new law defines all of the child safety zones to which these laws apply. They are similar to what we have discussed before. Schools, parks, pools, bus stops, daycares, and church, with churches still being exempt. The one big change is the inclusion of what the state constitutes an arc, to be an arcade. Arc arcades are defined as any space that has at least three games. So think of it this way. Many Walmarts have a tiny arcade at the front of the store. Walmart will now be a child safety zone due to those three ma machines being present. Other places might not be originally apparent to you in terms of child exclusionary zones. Stores and restaurants like Chick-fil-A and McDonald's often have play places in their restaurant for children. Those are now child safety zones. This excludes a lot more space than you originally thought, doesn't it? What is so interesting about this law is that over the last few years, the general law cities have fought tooth and nail to be able to have this law extended to them but many large home rule cities have chosen not to even adapt residence restrictions despite having the ability to do so. These are often expensive, time-consuming policies. It requires local law enforcement to do routine check-ins at different homes to make sure that the registered sex offender is living where they're supposed to be and are not in violation of the residency restrictions. It's a lot of time and effort and many departments don't have the resources to be able to actually implement these residency restrictions to the way that they need to do so. Texas parole and probation does have the authority to restrict individual offenders from living within a certain distance from child safety zones, but these restrictions only apply when the offender is on active supervision with the state. I have taken the liberty to show you a few maps that I have found from a few Texas cities that have provided these resources to sex offenders living in their jurisdictions. The first one is from Plano, Texas, and that city has a 1,000 foot boundary. From this map, you can see that there are a lot of areas that are excluded for sex offenders. Plano is a rather large city, so there's still quite a bit of availability. I don't know Plano as well as I know Tyler, but there are still parts of the city that are commercial or industrial rather than being residential. So even if there are places in which there are no buffered zones, they mu still might not be able to uh, be eligible for living space. Here we have Aransas Pass, Texas, and they have a 1,500 foot boundary in place. This means that the exclusionary zones are a bit larger than those in Plano. Aransas Pass is also a significantly smaller area than Plano, so there's less available living space to begin with here. As you can see from this map, each individual child safety zone gets its own 1,500 foot boundary and they begin to stack up pretty quickly. They begin to overlap and overlap and they push sex offenders out of available living space. They will, have to, um, they will then have to live in lower socioeconomic status areas, rural, rural areas, or might have to move out of the city altogether. As you may be aware, Aransas Pass was hit pretty hard by Hurricane Harvey in 2017. With recovery efforts occurring, registered sex offenders are often the last to be considered and will have to relocate as they cannot be transient that long without legal repercussions. Here we have El Paso, Texas, and their boundaries are also 1,000 feet. From this map, the city actually tells you which e what each of the restricted areas are in reference to. There are public and private schools, child care centers, and Head Start centers. Parks are listed on the map as well. In the Pebble Hills area, you can see the airport, so that's off limits. There's a rather large area on the bottom of the screen with no restrictions at all. That's Mexico. So once again, there are a lot of restricted areas in which these individuals cannot reside at all. The last thing that I want to discuss is the area of the logistic is the idea rather of the logistics behind residency restrictions. In 2017, I testified in front of the Texas legislature regarding the new law that authorizes general law cities the ability to implement residency restrictions. 
As part of that testimony, I discussed some of the logistical concerns that are associated with the implementation of residency restrictions in terms of zoning. For example, where do you begin the exclusionary zone? Does it begin at the property line? Does it begin at the center structure? Depending on where you begin your measurement, it could have a big difference on which residences are legal and which ones are illegal. In, uh, on the screen, you see a picture, um, and from this picture, you have an example of what I mean here. As part of that testimony, I mapped out a 1,000 foot boundary from the property line and the structural line of the same school here in Tyler. I have used Bell Elementary School as my example property because there are two streets that nicely work with my examples here. Points A and C are being measured from the structure's edge. Points B and D are measured from the uh, property boundary. As you can see from these lines, there is quite a big differential between points A and B, to the point where the house with the pool would not be a legal residence if you go by point B, but it would be a legal residence if you go by point A. That's a very tricky situation. I also mapped out things in a different way. My research partner and I actually took a series of progressive photographs to show how far a true 1,000 foot boundary is from a child safety zone. Using the same school as my example, I walked points C and D that we see, saw on the previous slide. From this slide, you can see from the picture on the left, I am beginning the from the structure's edge. The picture on the right has me beginning at the property line. Already you can see a rather large differential in terms of distance based on the zone's starting point. This series of photographs has me standing at 250 feet from the structure, the picture on the left, and from the property line, the picture on the right. These pictures are taken at 500 feet. You can, you can see a substantially large differential still taking place here. From these pictures, we are now at a full 1,000 feet. From the picture on the right, um, you can barely see me anymore. I'm very far away at this point, but the differential still exists between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. But what this picture shows is that 1,000 feet is a pretty long distance. This lecture focused on residency restrictions, <coughs> excuse me, and what happens when the state dictates where sex offenders are able to live. It is a difficult thing to try and implement and it is even more difficult for the registered sex offender to try and find somewhere legal, affordable, and safe to live at. One of the reasons why we took on this measurement project was to show just how difficult it is to compete to complete this type of project. If you are a registered sex offender trying to find a place to live in the community, how would you know where to live? In many jurisdictions, local law enforcement does not always provide you maps, such as those that I showed you earlier in the lecture. There is no one there to tell you where to live or where to measure the zone boundaries from. <clears throat> if you were working off the structure's edge, you might think that a particular house is fine, but then you find out that local law enforcement is working from the property's edge. Suddenly your house is illegal and you didn't even know it. <clears throat> It's a difficult thing to have to work out, and for many registered sex offenders, they are doing so on their own. This type of policy is a common practice across the majority of states, and they don't seem to be going anywhere, despite the notion that they are not effective at all in reducing registered sex offender recidivism. Next time, we're going to turn our attention to sex offender treatment. This will be our very last lecture for the semester. Please join me next time when we focus on Chapter 13 of the textbook. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.